Good afternoon. This is Clark Cantilever for ANN, broadcasting live from Monticello, Virginia, the home of Thomas Jefferson, who has so kindly allowed us to use his dining room while he is away on business in Washington. Today is March 1st, 1807. We have with us today the largest slave trader in Rhode Island. In the annals of the American slave trade, he and his brothers are without peers. We are going to hear the story of the Atlantic Slave Triangle directly from him, Captain James DeWolf, or as his friends call him, Captain Jim. How do you do, sir? Very well, thank you. Well, first of all, since we're in the president's dining room, I will refrain from smoking, but I do understand the president has some fine French wines. Well, yes, he does, but we'll have to get, that, get to that later on. Um, for right now, let's talk about the Atlantic Slave Triangle and how it works. We can use the globe over there. Well, first of all, since Congress has passed a bill to abolish my business, I can tell you all about it in detail. Although I doubt a trade that has existed for three centuries and will probably go into piracy will be stopped by one law, especially since the sugar and cotton plantations still exist. Yes, yes, you may be right, but let's go on. Can you give us an outline of how the slave trade works? Well, first of all, we have distilleries in Bristol, my town, and Newport, Rhode Island. 30 distilleries in the state converting rum out of molasses to trade with. Not ready to sail yet. First of all, we need to stock up on tobacco, rum, wool textiles, jewelry, knives, bread, gunpowder, cheap guns. Oh, and pots and kettles, we can't forget that. There is little or no demand for money. So now we can set sail on the first leg of the triangle to Guinea, Sierra Leone, and the Slave Coast, or Gold Coast, whatever you want to call it. Well, now that you're in Africa, do you go to a slave market or store? No, or no, auction? no, not at all. There are factors to be dealt with, which means agents of the African kings who kidnap their own natives or their neighbors. But we show them our wares, and with a dash of rum or a musket, which you can call a bribe, we go to a pal labor house. Why, it takes weeks up to a month to slave up or stock up a ship. You know, it costs 200 gallons down to 150, mostly 200 for one good working male slave. And now you're ready to take them back to Rhode Island? No, Rhode Island was never profitable in the slave labor trade. Our people prefer white servants over Negroes because of their tempers. I need to sell these slaves for molasses. So now it takes seven to nine weeks for the middle passage to go to Havana, Cuba, Jamaica, or the French island of Martinique in fair weather, longer if there's a lull in the wind. My name is Rosie Tinselberry, and I work for ANN, and I have here from a federal grand jury an indictment that says that Captain James DeWolf on July 1st. 1791 did murder a female slave because she had smallpox and simply flung her overboard the ship. Details said that Captain James DeWolf did clinched, seized upon her body, pushed, cast, and threw her out of the vessel into the sea and the ocean, whereby she then there sank, drowned, and died and is now resting at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. What do you have to say about that? Those charges are baseless, made up, and exaggerated by the right-wing extremists and the newspapers. I was never convicted of that crime. My record is clean. 
and the case was never processed, and the warrant was never served. And besides, those anti-trade slave laws are just an annoyance and are made to be broken. And furthermore, disposing of that blasted Negro was for the good of the ship. Okay, let's move on to the next step. You're in Havana, Cuba. What now? I sell the slaves for molasses. I have three sugar plantations in Cuba. So now we can head back for the final leg of the passage, back to Bristol, Rhode Island. And there, it takes 15,000 hogshead of molasses to convert to 12,000 hogshead of rum in the distilleries in Bristol, which I own. One volume measure of a hogshead is 63 gallons. So, you were never arrested or convicted of anything? No. I have one more humanitarian issue with you, for which I'd like an answer or an apology. I understand that you tie your African victim to a chair and toss them overboard. Is that true? Yes. And I do have a regret of losing that chair. Ah, Ms. Tinselberry, why don't you make some refreshments or something? Yes, I could use a refreshment. The air in here is getting bad. Well, now that you're back in Bristol, what have you accomplished? What have I accomplished? I'd say a fortune in the selling of molasses, rum, slaves, and sugar plantations. But what about the well-being of the slaves? Who cares? It's the making of money that's important. Why, well, I established a bank in Charleston and an insurance company in Bristol, run by Major William DeWolf, my brother. I also have a sideline with the Captain Cook of smuggling slaves into South Carolina. So now I can travel to Washington in style with a six-horse carriage and a male slave as a groom. Your coach and horses are ready, but I'm going to free your slave. He deserves his freedom like anyone else. You can't do that. He's my property. Captain Jim, you traffic in human flesh and sell it in molasses and rum in a profitable market as you sell guns, knives, textiles, and jewelry as if they were all the same. Good luck getting into heaven, sir. This is Clark Cantilever for ANN saying good afternoon. <laughs>